blue belt. He's like a blue belt in uh, jujitsu. He just had him on. And um, man, I hate pain. I do not like pain. But talking, yeah, listen to Rogan, the guys Rogan has on me, he makes me want to go try it out. He makes me want to go roll and get my, get my butt kicked. Shit, man. You know how many people are joining jujitsu because of Joe Rogan? I mean, really? Yeah. So Rogan's a black belt himself. He's a badass grappler. Um, He's a black I mean, belt? Yeah. Wow. Rogan's been training for a long time. Um, yeah, he's probably got thousands and thousands of people to join jujitsu. So you should try it out sometime. So for a guy who just hates pain, for a guy who just does not like pain, is it – should I try it out? Should I, should yeah. I mess with it? Well, they call jujitsu the gentle art because – you're not getting beat in the head repeatedly all day, right? So you're just like not getting your face smashed in. But they call it the gentle art. But then it's like, oh shit, I tore my labrum in my shoulder or I popped my rib. And so it's like pain over a long period of time. So you don't feel it. Yeah, <laughs> Dude, that, that aren't you like a Marine? Until the day I die. <laughs> I mean, you got a better beard than me. out there, but just because you got a better beard than me, and just because Jake, you can, you can, you can uh, talk to this as well. Just because I was in the Marine Corps does not mean I like pain. I don't like. <laughs> and Colin knows more about this than than me. I don't like my 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 arm popped out of my shoulder and my head hit on the mat multiple. T no, I I don't I don't like that. Well, I'll Joel, take, you you'd have fun, vid. You, you'd have fun. Really? What part yeah. of what part of town do you live in, Joel? Fulcher, west side, west of oh, Katy, okay. Cross Creek Ranch. Yeah, you're 20 minutes away from me, man. I'll take you to my gym. Oh. <laughs> Dude, my, so, so the pastor of my church, uh, Jim Stern, he's a, he's a big jiu-jitsu guy. He's in the Heights at uh, – it's one of Gracie's places. I know he's got a bunch of them. It's uh, – Yeah, Gracie. Jungle. Gracie, Urban, Gracie, Urban Jungle. Oh, Urban Is Jungle, right? yeah. yeah. Yeah, Urban Jungle. And he's always like, come on, bro. Let's go, bro. And I'm like, dude, I don't, I don't <laughs> want you to kick my ass, man. Like, And the same for you, like – Dude, it's, it's kind of one of those things you stop while you're ahead. Like, just yeah. stop well, while you're ahead. After this quarantine, man, I'll get you up to the gym. We'll make a killer out of you for sure. So, uh, uh, all right, dudes, let's introduce y'all real quick. Today we got my boys, Roy and Joel. Guys, Roy, you want to give a little background on yourself, man? What are you, what are you up to these days? Uh, yeah, sure, man. So these days I'm at Drill Formance. Uh, I'm the director of business development and marketing nowadays. Uh, really, it's just a fancy title for uh, I post stuff online and try and sling a few bits here and there. Right. But uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's fun. It's a good little company. Um, before that, I was at um, Corva, like everybody knows. But I come from a background of downhole tools and data. Um, I've been doing this now. I've been in oil and gas for 11 years. Uh, it found me. I did not find it. So I uh, actually started my oil and gas career in, in uh, Austin and with a small startup. And so it's kind of my roots is the, the smaller side of the, of the world. So um, but yeah, that's 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 about a, that's the elevator pitch of, of my background. Nice, man. Yeah, we uh, we were just with Greg today from Corva, so we got some stories to share about you later. Speaking sp <laughs> speaking of that, let's. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen really quickly before we get to Joel. Oh boy. Uh oh. Oh no. Is this? Uh, what is this? What is we got, this? We got something good to share on this show. Oh, oh damn, yes, that's, dude. Is that Joe exactly? Roy. Is oh, that, bro. That's nasty, bro. You can be the that goatee. Hey, true story. I went to a baby shower with that Fu Manchu and had a beard like this. And uh, right before the baby shower, I walked to get the Huggies and Chuggies, you know, the box of diapers and a case of beer. And there was like everybody else was doing the same thing at the Kroger by this guy's house. And people that I knew, you know, pretty well were walking right by me. And then finally, one dude was like, oh, whoa. And they're like, did it? And he, he said, "Do they let you buy elementary schools with that, or what?" Yeah. But you went, from, you went from cool bearded guy to fucking Oklahoma redneck <laughs> real quick. Yeah, I mean, I could sell meth with that thing, you know. <laughs> Fuck yeah, you could. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. You were uh, Joel earlier. You were talking about your pastor, and someone said Joel Oilstein is your true pastor. So I don't know if you guys are on Twitter or not, but. Um, we came up with this meme instead of Joel Olstein. It's Joel Oilstein. And that's uh, hilarious. for you, yeah. for you guys, that's hilarious. Yeah, yeah. It's over on over on Twitter. So um, 
yeah, I'm looking. If you guys, I don't know, Joel and Roy, can you see the live comments? Have y'all turned them on over on y'all screen? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah cool. So you'll be able to see people. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, Greg. Oh, I hope I want already. to. <laughs> yeah. Sooner or later, some people will come in here and start talking shit. It gets fun. Yeah, uh, Joel, give us a little bit of background on yourself, man. Oh man, uh, I'm just a nobody, man. I'm just a I'm just a, a schmuck, man. Um, so uh, former U.S. Marine. I uh, also a first generation college student, a college graduate, excuse me. Uh, pretty proud of that. Uh, I'm a dad. I got one on the way. Um, I am a uh, sales guy through and through. I went to school for sales at University of Houston at Bauer. And uh, I am at, uh, I've, been in, I've been in the old business, um, I think about eight years, give or take. Uh, I started with Slumber's Day and then got a, a real good taste of what a downturn means uh, during the first downturn of 14. And decided to stay in oil and gas. I'm at a company called Veritas Total Solutions. It's a consulting company. Uh, Veritas, uh, it's a smaller organization, about 40 folks, uh, good folks. Um, and uh, couldn't couldn't uh, could have asked to be with a, a better bunch of uh, better bunch of uh, people during during this downturn during $19 oil, which never thought we would see, uh, unfortunately. So currently, I'm in a uh, integrated operations uh, business development role where I'm calling on uh, majors and super majors and uh, making their operation uh, significantly more efficient, uh, offshore, onshore, um, and theoretically, uh, not just oil and gas, but anywhere. So, Cool. Yeah, you talk about that downturn in 14, 16. Um, I was actually on the North Slope when oil prices fell out in 2014, and uh, I was up there for a month, and our company laid off something around 70% of the company. And I was like, fuck, they can't lay me off if I'm up here on the North Slope. So I ended up getting stuck up there for a month. And uh, did you guys, Joel, you saw the D-Day video, right? Dude, epic. You know, the guy that Dude, thought- I, could, I could talk about that all day long. And there was some comments in there. <laughs> Man, I, I almost went keyboard warrior and I was like, mm, no, no. The filter kicked in and I was like, no, nah, we're going to lay guy, off the keyboard warrior. The guy warrior. that was hiding in, hiding in the bathroom so Dude. he didn't get laid off. That was me, except I was on the North Slope in 2014. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the funniest part, who, I want to know who came up with the Oxy and Apache drowning and getting shot at. Who came up with that? I was, that was me. Dude, I, I, I made that whole video in like an hour and a half. I was about to go to bed and I was uh, having a glass of wine and, and talking to my wife. And I was like, fuck, I just got this meme idea and I got to stay up all Dude. night making it. So I was there in my, in my living room at 1.30 in the morning making the sound effects like, uh, 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 that's, so awesome. That's, awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. That's so, awesome. Yeah, that was outstanding, gents. That was, that was freaking fantastic. Yeah, so Dude, a friend of mine is a landman at Oxy, and uh, even he got a chuckle out of that. <laughs> <laughs> How are so let not not to not to totally take this uh, in a different direction. So I remember during um, the, the last downturn, there was uh, the wife and I got an Uber and we were doing a date night, and we say, hey, man, you know, what do you do? And he's like, well, I'm an oil and gas, but my job no longer exists. And well, Okay, what are you doing? He's like, I'm, I was a landman, but that doesn't exist anymore. And I was like, wow, never heard that before. That's crazy. And I was driving an Uber. So landman, what do you guys know about? I mean, is that, I don't know much about that side of the business. Is that a, is that a thing? Like uh, what, what's happened to those guys? I mean, are yeah, those guys so, getting slaughtered? I mean, my I buddy, and maybe I shouldn't say this, but my buddy is, uh, I don't even think he's watching. Uh, uh, he said he <laughs> would, but uh, he's probably scared shitless. I'll say something. Uh, but he says right now he's busier than ever. I mean, because right now they're having to walk away from stuff too. And so they're, you know, they're having to call landowners. And he said, really, it doesn't cost them anything in the grand scheme of things to just walk away. So he's, you know, they're doing evaluations and looking at numbers and, and um, talking to their partners. And um, basically, they're looking at what, like, what's it in the grand scheme of things going to cost us to essentially just, um, cap this well and walk away for a while uh, or at all like completely right and so he said he's busier now than he was before all this because of all that's that interesting. but he's yeah, had dad, to cut his team down too so I mean that maybe could be from that too right my dad's a landman and he's been out of work for six months and there's a lot of landmen that are out of work right now so it's not you know not a Good market for landmen, to say the least. Alex Lindsay said landmen polish knobs under all market conditions. Yeah, I saw that right before you said you're coming about your dad. Great job, Alex. Keep it classy, buddy. Keep it classy. Good times, bad times. Landmen are there polishing some knobs. 
So, yeah. yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's rough for the entire industry, right? But, you know, you guys, both of y'all are in sales, right? So, Roy, you said you're, you're doing a lot of marketing now, but I mean, really your, your sales business development, you know, probably just chief of getting, getting shit done over there. Um, you know, what are you guys seeing on the sales side, especially like with COVID? I mean, you don't, you're not just dealing with the price crash, right? But you're dealing with, you can't even go to a client and talk to them. Yeah. So this is a lot different. Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, so, so I grew up in Austin, right. And, uh, my mom worked for a software company all through the dot coms and everything. And she worked for a little company called Beechreef Technologies that sold to a bunch of different companies that ultimately wound up being a company called Actian. Um, yeah. You guys might recognize that name because now, now they handle a lot of like billing that a lot of oil and gas companies use um, and billing software. So um, it, uh, it it's actually kind of funny because all throughout the years and like my career, she's fed me stuff that those sales teams were working on. And so uh, I really started honing in on you know, how, how do software guys do it? And they have this crazy algorithm to where they're basically like, you know, you make 200 calls a day and out of those 200 calls a day, you should have, you know, X number of leads. And out of those X number of leads, you should have X amount of revenue generating touches. Right. And, mm -hmm. uh, and it's completely done. Like there's no emotion. It's just over the phone and, you know, think Wolf of Wall Street type stuff. Right. And, uh, but there's a method to the madness, but, you know, ultimately, you know, in, in, on this side, I, of the business, which is where I started and where I am now, but you know, it's all all tools and especially bit sales are done by darkening somebody's doorway, right? So I mean, it's face to face, it's relationship driven, it's data driven too. But it's really weird. Um, a lot of people would kill me for saying this, probably, but bits and tools are not bought solely on data. Um, they're, they're bought almost a hundred percent. I'd say it's probably eighty twenty. Uh, relationship, right? So it's gotten a lot harder for folks on this side, definitely to try and make those decisions. So, you know, it really starts to, to look at where were you before all this started? And where were your relationships there, you know, before? And who will answer the phone when you call them now? And then the other thing is, is essentially, if you switch to like a software type sales structure to where you're making calls and sending emails and shooting text, the amount of customers that we used to take three, four days a week to touch driving around the truck and doing this, you know, these various meetings. Now you're able to touch the same amount of people in like, you know, a good guy should be able to do that in two days. Right. Yeah. And yeah, it's, funny that you, it's funny that you made a comment about driving around in a truck because someone on Twitter today created this parody account called Ford Raptor owner. I don't know if you guys can see it or not. But the bio says, I'm 32 years old. I drive this Raptor from rig to rig in the dirty west. I'm an account manager who brings the rig lunch and sucks the company man's dick. <laughs> <laughs> this, I mean, you get a good deal on a Raptor right now. <laughs> well, the, the, reason someone, the reason someone made the, the account is because another, another person said that um, it's a good performance indicator of how the oil fields do join. You can check um, how many Ford Raptors are for sale in Midland, Odessa. And there's like, right. there's 29 for sale right now. So, <laughs> I mean, that's the thing though. Is, and the other thing is like, uh, I'll say this, I'll be, you know, salespeople in general, um, and I'm one, so maybe I can say this, but salespeople in general are, uh, are they're, they're quick to become complacent and they're quick to become lazy. And, I'm not a popular guy for saying that I'm sure, but I'm not a normal salesperson. Right. So like, I'll tell you this too, is that, um, people instantly, they, they get a win, um, pick an account, right. Somewhere they dropped a clutchy off, right. And shot the shit with 10 other salespeople. And, uh, they're like, Oh, okay, well I can chill out now. I, I got one run. And, uh, but ultimately, you know, like those guys aren't the ones that are still working. Like if people are still employed today, it's because, you know, you were kicking ass and taking names, right? Either that or most people even right now can't hide if you're a pet. Like if you're, if you were a favorite, like in this market, you can't hide. And like you're either closing deals or, you know, you're kicking rocks right now. And, um, you know, or there's other value that can be seen in folks right now, but ultimately you can wear different hats or closed deals and if you can't do that you know people just don't have room for you and 
um, that's the long and short of it. And so, yeah. speaking of hats, Greg it, said that bit sales is ninety five percent hats, four percent relationships, and one percent <laughs> data. <laughs> lots yeah, of, so lots, lots of hats the, going out. <laughs> here's the crazy thing, right? So, like, everybody wants data, right? Well, uh, explain this to me. Everybody's like, "Oh, well, yeah, I like I like what your bits do, right? Let's um, uh, bring me the data and show me what you can do." But then. In order to get data, you have to get a run. So it's, you know, it's kind of a, you're damned if you do, <laughs> damned if you yeah. don't, because you literally have to have someone take a risk on you and put something in the hole so you can get some data. And then that data is invaluable, whether it's good or bad run, right? And Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, hey, Sue said here, relationships piss off the NBA folks because you can't model it. Um, <laughs> it's a funny story. So I was talking to a big service company <clears throat> executives and they are telling me about how they closed down this is a couple years ago they closed down their pressure pumping service out in uh west texas and i was like you know why why didn't you want to be in that business why didn't you want to be in pressure pumping or fracking anymore and it's like it's just impossible for us to compete with the small mom and pop shop when they're going to church every sunday with their clients he's like how do we how do we compete with that we can't compete on price so you know i think relationships are really important in this industry um yeah, I think it's also. I was talking to I was talking to a couple of buddies that are MBAs. It's funny because you talk to them. You know, I'm always interested in going back to school to get an MBA just to continue learning. And every single MBA that I talk to about it, it's like, why would you want to do that? Most people just go to school uh, to get their MBA to get the network. Like, if you already have the network, why would you go back to school to get your MBA? I'm like, well, I got the network, but now I want to learn what the fuck I'm doing. So, um, you know, I think whatever way you go, you know, relationships is important, regardless if you have your MBA or if you're just coming up the ranks throughout the field. You know, that's, that's so true to those right now. Like, you know, I'll be honest, a lot of our guys on our sales team or um, they weren't real big into LinkedIn. And so a lot of my last couple of weeks, month almost now has been really pushing, um, you know, how active are you guys on LinkedIn? Like, are you commenting? Are you liking, are you just sitting in the dark and watching, you know, are you some creeper? Uh, or are you actually participating in this? Uh, is your network benefiting from you actually having an account and connecting with you? Um, you know, that's one thing. You know, you guys and 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 I have talked about this in the past, but like that network can be so powerful, right? I mean, this week alone, we made a post. Um, Drill Formance did, and uh, we had a we had a pretty solid run on a twelve and a quarter with with one of our tools, uh, a little Excel glide that that we use a lot in the intermediate. And uh, a customer from a customer actually that used to be a customer of mine at Conoco is now working on some projects in China. And so he reached out to me and said, hey, would you guys be interested in doing some work in China? I saw this on LinkedIn. And uh, I mean, ultimately, is there any cash behind that right now? No, there's nothing. But um, I mean, with the way things are moving with that particular lead, I mean, here in the next six months or so, I could have tools in China and be making quite a bit of money on that. And that all came 100% from a LinkedIn post, right? Just wait until uh, coronavirus has settled down, bro. Yeah. I'm to go over there. <laughs> yeah, I heard about that. Yeah. That? <laughs> yeah, this crazy little town called to, Wuhan. Like, who knew? We used to run a lot of expandable casing over in China um, before I got over there to venture. But our uh, hands used to tell me about it. And one time uh, he said he was on a job in China for a month and he lost 30 pounds because he's out in the countryside. You know, he's not like in Beijing. He's out in the, you know, boonies of China. And he's like, I'm not fucking eating that food. I don't have a clue what I'm eating. So he just, uh, Lost thirty pounds during during the entire time. Let's see what. Uh, oh shit, we got Rob Waters in What's here. What's the Rob? <laughs> we got to get Rob on the show. He said NBA yeah, guys. Said NBA guys, go ahead. Yeah, NBA guys <laughs> are too busy trying to model shut in revenues to be pissed about relationship value right now. I, I think there's a lot of debate right now. People are trying to figure out. You know, I see a lot of arguments on Twitter and LinkedIn about if you can even shut in uh, unconventional wells and still have decent performance after you get them back online. And so I guess like no one's really tried it at scale. So, you know, we have a lot of experience with it in conventional wells, but I see a lot of debate back and forth on Twitter of whether or not that's even smart to shut in wells. So who knows? It sounds like the government's going to come in and nationalize oil and pay everyone to keep it in the ground. So. We may have a uh, United States oil company here soon. Maybe they'll call it Bropec. 
They're going to save us. They're going to save us all. The government. <laughs> Give us some of our civil liberties, a couple of AR-15s, and stimulus check or two, and we'll be good. Did y'all, y'all get a stimulus check? I didn't get a stimulus check. Did y'all get one? Negatory. Are you kidding? I really? I'm the only one that got a stimulus check? I didn't, I didn't get stimulated I, I know, at all. I know tons of people that got them. And I'm well, that's like, what happens when you, file, when you don't file your taxes, gents. <laughs> <laughs> like that. And then I saw that the uh, Jake did a, a live call, I think, two weeks ago with a attorney and an accountant talking about the uh, PPP loans for small businesses and saw today that they ran out of money. So, um, you know, I don't know a single small business that got a loan from the government. So it sounds like they ran out pretty quick, too. There are times, if you guys want to check it out, I, I don't quote me on this. I have to go back and look, and, and my marketing girl's going to kill me because she was the one that posted it. Veritas, I believe, just got approved for a, a PPE loan uh, slash grant, whatever it is. <clears throat> that's the payroll protection, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's it. So Veritas applied and uh, did, a, did a blog post on that. Uh, so nice. go check that out on, on our experience with that. So if you're a small business owner and want to want to look into uh, how, how Veritas did it, uh, VeritasTotalSolutions.com. Check it out. And there's a whole, they laid, they laid it all out from the partner. So yeah. Yeah, it sounds like the government doesn't have any money though. So if you want it, you're shit out of luck. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Keith, uh, Keith said uh, he's a geologist and engineer with an MBA. I'm on the science side these days, but an MBA does help me pierce the veil and get my tech message across to the bean boys. <laughs> yeah. that there was, uh, a, there was a post call. Let me interrupt you, man. There was a post from Robert. And the last, uh, the last five words there: under promise and over deliver. I mean, can we, can we, can we talk about that for a second, Roy? How, how hard is that to, to do as a sales guy? Don't lie, Jesus is watching. <laughs> under promise and over deliver. Um, let me tell you, that's probably the most difficult. I mean, you want to go in there and sell the shit out of everything you got, right? And uh, so, trying to set realistic expectations is, I mean. One, it's not just hard. realistic, but under promise. Yeah, well, that's even the, the you know, it. Uh, I mean, it, it's very hard to do ultimately, right? Uh, but not to mention that, like, a lot of times, clients have these. All clients, all the time, always want to ride two horses with one ass. They want to stay in the hole as long as possible and go as fast as they fucking can. And then when you go as fast as you can, but you don't stay in the hole quite as long as they wanted to. Then they're like, well, this fucking sucks. Why are we doing this? And you're like, you, you said you wanted something to go fast. I gave you fast. And now you're like, well, that sucked. I didn't want fast. I wanted really what I wanted was you can't win for losing really. But I mean, when you can hit the nail on the head and you just show up and be like, yeah, I think we can do this. And the customer's like, all right, well, I'll give you a shot because you said you can. And then you knock it out of the park. That's how accounts flip on the vendor side, right? Ultimately, you go in and you make that happen. and you do a couple of those in a row, boom, you've just converted that whole account to say, you know, they were running Halliburton and now they're running drill formants or, you know, whoever. Right. But ultimately that's, that's when you see those big swings and account shifts. That's, that's usually what happened. Yeah. How does, you know, how do you guys get an edge? Like when I look at drill bits, it seems pretty commoditized. Um, you know, a PDC is a PDC in my mind. Now I know there's probably data that says different, like, oh, you know, we did a run, you know, in so many, so many hours, they were able to drill intermediate formation or they were able to stay in the hole this long. But, you know, from a client's perspective, they probably see all bits as kind of in the same, same playing field. Right. So how do you differentiate yourself? I mean, that's really hard. Right. Um, the real, the, the honest answer to that is, you know, they damn near are commoditized, whether people like yeah. to admit it or not, right? Um, really and truly, Reed Heikelog had, you know, they own more patents in the bit world than probably most folks combined. Uh, and a mm-hmm. lot of them run out now, but like for a long time, Reed Heikelog was just printing checks based on everyone else using their uh, patents for cutter technology. And then you know, some of those ran out and they're like, oh shit, well, we need to go make some more money. Let's, you know, go back to the bit game. And uh, so they did, you know, they did great with those, but you know, the bit game is a lot of, it's the relationship, right? And so there is some technology, you know, and deep leaching cutters has been around for a while. So, I mean, like a lot of that technology is around, but like 
the cutter placement in the actual bit, uh, the different rake angles, different, you know, the different designs in the actual, the bit as a whole, not just the specific cutter. Um, you know, those really start to come into play, but ultimately like you talk to the guys like, like um, at Birch resources, right? They're one of the top performers in Midland Basin, hands down by a long shot and they're smoking everybody. And, um, you know, I talked to him like, you know, they're drilling deep 12 and a quarters, which historically have not been great performing intervals, but those guys, it's not like you ask them what the real differentiator is. And I, and I did. And, you know, what they're telling us is, um, it's not the bit, it's the drillers they have and what they push on their guys. And they're watching those intervals and they're making changes and they're standing on that brake handle the whole damn time. And when they see something happen, they're making an adjustment on the fly and that's how they're really putting the, you know, I mean, they are running some, I mean, they're running big nine inch, you know, nine and five eighths inch BHAs that no one else is. And they have rigs yeah. and pump through it. So, I mean, they've spent the money, they got the big rigs, but ultimately they're spanking everybody's ass in Midland Basin. Um, yeah. It's those big BHAs and they have guys that are paying attention. And Fred Dupreece, you know, n name anyone you want to in the industry, but they'll tell you, watch those parameters and that's how you're going to have the biggest step changes. Yeah, Nacho's LLC said that days versus depth initiatives are the true killer to generating great wells. Um, that's funny. I always think about like my days on the rig with the salesman. It would have been funny if we ever ran across each other, Roy, but like if you didn't bring <laughs> a fucking case of Coke and you wanted me to load up your bid, I'd tell you to go get fucking loaded yourself. Like throw the bid off the floor onto the side of the rig. Like here's your fucking bid. <laughs> Dude, back in the day, we used to run these little survey on connection tools, right? And they were little, little dumb tools. Uh, with everybody was drilling post holes, right? So, I mean, they were, they were the thing back then. Yeah. I had this, uh, no shit, this guy's name was Nacho. Uh, and he was on <laughs> ATP 352 drilling for Pioneer Natural. Everyone and, knows uh, a Nacho in the oil field. <laughs> dude, this dude would always call me and he'd be like, hey, bro, your tool is not working, man. I'm like, oh, what's going on? Talk me through it. Like, what'd you do? What'd you pump? And uh, he's like, oh, no, I just think it needs a cheeseburger, man. And I'm like, what do you, what do you mean? He's like, man, I just think it needs a supersonic cheeseburger. <laughs> All right, well, I got one coming your way then. <laughs> a burger and a large trial say this shit's working. <laughs> do, you, do you remember, like, we used to run these survey tools when I was on the rig. You know, we just drilled vertical wells when I was roughnecking, but it was just a survey tool that you would drop down the pipe on a little, like, slick line that we had built into the rig. Is that the same type of survey that you guys were running? Yeah. Or these? Was it a mechanical, like, wind-up one, or did you, was it electronic? And then you uh, it, 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 it was actually electronic. So we had a little computer that we could hook it up to in the doghouse and yeah. download the information, but I always heard about the, the manual ones. So more than likely, uh, you were running what was called either an e-drift or then after they sold the Totco, it was called an e-Totco. And uh, the same technology that was in that tool. So the guy that I worked for, started my oilfield career with, was a guy named Dave Close. And uh, he owned a company called Welltronics. And so he built those tools. Yeah. And so then um, he went from... Uh, uh, so he, he sold that technology to the Totco in 05 and then kept some of the rights and then went back and developed that tool I showed you guys earlier. Yeah. And, uh, then sold it again in 10 to NOV. And uh, that's how I got to NOV. But those tools are same technology, same stuff. So here's the crazy thing, right? Uh, so back in the day, those tools you're talking about, there were two options. One was like a wind up, right? And you drop it down the well on a, on a it was just like a time clock basically, yeah. right? Yeah. You wind it up, drop it down. And there was a little target. And then depending on how it was sitting in the pipe is you'd take those and then it would fire and punch a hole. And then you'd trip back out of the hole and get it out and be like, Oh yeah, well we're, you know, two degrees deviated. Yeah. And then, uh, but the problem was, is nobody wanted to shut down to take a survey. So then yeah. everybody would do what they called dog house and surveys. And uh, so you'd go in any dog house back in the straight hole days and you'd look around, there'd be all these little marks and it'd say like 0.15 or 0. Yeah. 0.5 or 1.5. And so they would just, instead of stopping to actually take their railroad commission required survey, they just set that shit up in the dock house and keep Dude. drilling and let it go off and then record that. The funniest, right when I got on a wire line, I was in pipe recovery and I go out to this rig and they were 18 degrees deviated on a vertical well. <laughs> and How does that happen? 
Yeah, so they had a, a nice. seamless well and time drill, and then they ended up getting stuck, and so I had to come out there and pre-point and back them off. But uh, I was like, how the fuck do you get 18 degrees deviated? And he's like, well, we kept running surveys, and we didn't believe that it was accurate, so we just kept <laughs> drilling. I was like, God damn, dude. Hey, fucking... You don't know what where that was, do you? Uh, it was in uh, uh, Stanton, Martin County, just right off of I-20. Okay. It was a I had the same show. thing happen in uh, the door of Roberts right south of Midland. Oh, okay. And, uh, I mean, same story. Uh, I'm sure that shit's happened plenty I, of I wonder if that's the same. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if that's the same operator who's about to uh, declare Chapter 11 based out of Oklahoma, a big independent. It starts with a C. I wonder if it's, I wonder if it's those guys. It's like, which, which one? <laughs> There's lots of them. Josh Pollard said that he's always buying – his guy's food pays off 10 times for tenfold. Guys go to war for you when you take care of them. That's like the fucking you should be sticker. Hey, I got one for you. What would you have done for a Monahan's nipple up sticker? <laughs> Dude, I always wanted a Monahan's nipple up sticker. And uh, <laughs> well, what's funny is <clears throat> Monahan's, I had a nipple up my own BOP. We never had a third party come do it. And I always heard this fucking. This story is like a myth to me that there was a service company called Monahan's Nipple Up Crew that actually did this for a living. I'm like, why the fuck am I in here in a cellar with a you know hammer wrench, fucking getting my finger smashed by some fucking roughneck that can't swing a hammer? <laughs> when there's third parties that have air wrenches for this, what the fuck? So I never even, dude, spent ten years in the field. I never even saw Monahan's Nipple Up Crew. Um, I only heard about them, so it's like a legend to me. <laughs> Best stickers ever, man. Um, so it's funny. We were talking, Roy, we were talking to Greg today. I was just looking at all the ducks and, uh, skulls that you have mounted back there. And he was talking about y'all going fishing sometime soon. And, uh, Greg was, man, he was saying that you're a little bougie when it comes to, to fishing, that you need all the best gear and, uh, that, you know, you, you got to have the best of everything. And he's, he's more kind of poor boy in it. Is that, is that true, man? Are you, are you? Uh, yeah, high maintenance when it comes to fishing. Uh, yeah, what's the bougie yeah, term you know. for fishermen? <clears throat> uh, I think we just, yeah, yeah. We'll, uh, I think a lot of guys just call that uh, uh, gear whores, <laughs> gear whores. <laughs> uh, but I, hey, look, I, I practice what I preach, man. Uh, look, a friend of mine when I was in high school told me this. He said, Look, you, you if you buy the best, you only cry once, and uh. Let me tell you, in saltwater and hunting gear, you can't – guns – I mean, there's, it goes a long ways, right? And the best is, you know, obviously it's an opinion I've said a lot of times. But uh, I uh, I buy good quality stuff. It's expensive. Uh, but guess <laughs> what? I put that shit through hell, and if it can't take it, then uh, I'll let them know and everybody else and their dog know that it's a piece of junk. And uh, – but like I wear Sims waders, the waders I wear, they're six hundred, seven hundred dollars. Um, but I mean, I get five, six seasons out of them, and everybody yeah. else is getting one maybe. And uh, I told Greg since he has a bay boat that we're gonna have to go fishing, so maybe we'll take like a digital ball catters fucking fishing trip. You can put me to shame. I was telling him like I don't have patience to be a fisher. Like I'll, if I'm fishing out like in a pond or a lake, I'm like sitting there like. Bite, motherfucker, bite. Like, I'll sit there for like 20 minutes. And I'm like, all right. Yeah, you, you don't even have to give me a rod. I'll just I'll just sit out there and drink beer the whole time. I have no patience for fishing. I never have. Hey, do, you ever go, do you ever go shoot skeet? Yeah. Or trap? Hey, next time you see Greg, ask him about uh, – I'm he's still watching. I'm sure he'll post in here. But ask him how uh, ask him how clay shoots when him and I went. We, we went on – when I was with Corva, we did a lot of clay shoots, right? Fun stuff. And Greg, does Greg – y'all know Greg used to be a DD? No, I didn't know that. So you want to talk about the prima donnas of the oil field? <laughs> this cat used to make uh, – yeah, and Todd's right. So uh, I have a uh, – Todd Yonix joining us here. He just posted, boy, has a beautiful turquoise reel. Yeah, uh, that's true. It's uh, a company came out with a Texas edition, and it's turquoise. Everything's beefed up, you know, better parts, the whole nine yards. Uh, so uh, – we gotta get. I think when we go fishing, we gotta get Todd. We gotta get you. And we get gotta get Greg. It's probably bullshit. Like we've been we've been talking all this shit with Greg, and we haven't. Jake, you should probably send him a link so he can come in here and defend himself. 
Dude, uh, well, first of all, Greg talks a lot of trash, but um, yeah, but what do you do? Like, really, Greg, what do you do when your gun's so pretty that your buddy takes your gun and outshoots you with your own gun <laughs> and then hands it back to you with the barrel still smoking and says, Good gun. Alex Lindsay said the directional drillers are like the Kardashians of the oil patch. <laughs> <laughs> so Have you guys seen that? Have you guys seen that documentary on director uh, on the on DDs? It came out like I don't know. It came out like four or five years ago. A Was one of them married to Kanye? But they go to they go to Vegas. These guys make I don't know buku, oh, and they go to Vegas every yes. like three weeks or something. I forgot about that shit. Yeah, talking just about how much money they make as directors yeah. and shit. It might be a vice. It might be a vice yeah. news. They're super I liberal, but man, they put out some good it. stuff. Yeah, it's funny, man. I. Uh, I always talk shit about like there's two types of people I don't like in the oil field: frat cans and directional drillers. And uh, directional drillers are just the prima donnas of oil and gas. So I'm surprised that Greg is one. Greg's Greg's cool. I wouldn't have expected him to come from that background. Dude, well, when we were at Corva, there were times when I was like, "Look, Greg, I need you. We're going into this meeting, and these dudes are going to push us in a corner. I know it. I'm like, I need you to tap into that arrogant asshole, cocky mother." <laughs> I need, like, that guy. I need that guy. And Greg would be like, I mean, you literally have to be like kicking him under the table, like say something. <laughs> <laughs> Kick it on, flip the switch. Dude, like every single fucking directional driller is, um, they're, they're cocksuckers, man. I mean, they're all arrogant. And, uh, why? 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 Why is that? They, they think they're fucking God on location, man. And um, then and there's a new transition to manage pressure drilling hands. And, um, when I was up in Alaska, uh, I got into it with this this hand from Weatherford, managed pressure drilling hand, and um, he starts just talking mad shit to me and had to let him know real quick that MPD was the only reason I was out there in the uh, in the first place. So, um, you know, you get, you get some of these guys, MPD hands and uh, directional drillers, man. I don't, I don't. It's like a, a rite of passage. Like you make it to directional driller, which you know. You don't got to know shit to be a directional driller. You can fucking work a calculator and some models. Greg can tell you this. Um, <laughs> well, we'll give Greg a shot on the show next time so he can come in here and, and talk shit and defend himself and directional drillers. We'll let him be the spokesperson. <laughs> you should do a directional drillers, uh, digital wildcatters. Get these guys in here and and, uh, and, and let, hear what they have to say. Get two or three of them. Dude, we I should. got a couple. I'll give you some names. Dude, let's, let's, <laughs> let's <laughs> We should do it. <clears throat> yeah, Alex said directional drillers are like because I know trigonometry, I'm better than you, and that's exactly that's exactly it. It's just kind of like this this sense of arrogance. So, look, I got lots of friends that are directional drillers. You know, I love you guys. I just you know I gotta bust your balls every once in a while, set you straight. But how how are you guys? Um, you know, obviously oil patch is going through a lot of shit right now. Um, you know, it's affecting, you know, both of you guys. Uh, actually, Joel, I, I don't know about you anymore, um, but Roy, I know you have, you know, direct correlation with rig count. You know, obviously, if rig count's going down, people aren't running bits. So, you know, how do you guys look at the next, you know, 12 to 18 months and mitigate those those issues? Are you, you know, kind of focusing on just becoming more efficient with your client or your your current clients or what's the strategy for you guys on the sales side not selling i'm doing zero selling right now when i when we went into this thing i really wasn't sure how to you know there's all kinds of sales gurus and oil and gas gurus that'll give you the right answer maybe some of those answers are right but right off the bat i took the um uh show compassion show a lot of empathy i knew that everybody i was going to be emailing and calling and you know, talking to and interacting with was either getting ready to lay off. Most people were either getting ready to lay off people and some of those were getting ready to get laid off or, or prepping for that, even at the super majors and the majors. Yeah. And so I did, I did no selling. It was, it was, I kind of took a, a, a little bit of my own advice and, um, and just let everybody know I was there for them. Hey, look, I'm, this sucks. I know our cut it sucks for our country, it sucks for the world and it especially sucks for the oil field. Uh, but I'm here if you need me. Uh, if there's somebody I, you know, I can make a connection to, um, let me know uh, if there's something my company can do, Veritas can do, let me know. Uh, I'd love to help you. And that's kind of the approach I've taken. Um, yeah, you're trying, just, to, so you're trying to be and, and if, net positive. Cause I'm not going to do any selling. What, yeah. What I'm doing, what I'm doing, calling on, you, you know, 
uh, uh, big cap edge projects and, and, you know, the Exxon's and the BP's and the Total's and the Chevron's of the world where, you know, my, my, you know, my prices start, it's a super long, um, very strategic sales cycle. It's a very strategic sale that involves a lot of C-level folks, a VP and above usually, depending on the organization, uh, some C-level and nobody's buying right now. These guys mm -hmm. are, these guys are batting down the hatches. Uh, they're, they're probably stressed out than, than Roy and I combined. And so uh, showing that, look, I, I get it. That, that's unfortunate. If we can help you in any way, uh, I'm in this for the long game. I'm not trying to make a sale now. And my, my leadership, Veritas leadership has been very supportive of that and loves that idea. Uh, it's cool that um, very very toss like understands that you know as a sales and biz dev guy you're not going to be out there selling right now you know and and is not just absolutely just completely getting rid of their entire yeah. sales staff like so many companies yeah. are yep. uh, yeah Alex, it's, it's unfortunate you know it's also fortunate not not to not to not to make this a whole you know veritas deal but when you have leadership um like like i have that that has i, I can't say prep for the pandemic but ran the company good uh, efficiently and not overspent, et cetera. You know, we, we, we talked about Chesapeake starting off the, starting off the, the live stream. We talked about Chesapeake and how they're just, their stock went in reverse, reverse split. Like I've never even heard of that. Like I had to Google what that meant. Like what <laughs> doesn't even happen, you know, like, you know, and, and, and again, not, not, to, yeah, not, not <laughs> to, not to pick on Chesapeake because there's a lot of folks out there. I mean, Sanchez, Sanchez, uh, a couple of years ago just did that. They had made a profit since 2013. And it's like, how, how does that happen? And so I'm, I'm very fortunate. Well, the, the, San, the, Sanchez, the Sanchez brothers have, um, Sanchez brothers have made almost $120 million personally while the company goes bankrupt. So yeah, the, Sanchez, the company hasn't made any money, but Sanchez, the family has. So let's distinguish the difference between the two. And, and, um, and look, I'm not a, I'm not a CFO. I'm not a financial guy. Uh, so, you know, maybe they have, they probably have the reasons, whatever, uh, the, the knee jerk is greed. Uh, and I'm not saying that that that, that uh, Jake, you laugh, but it's, I, I mean, I I think that's what it what it is. Some it degree did, of that. It doesn't it doesn't take a finance degree to to understand that something like Sanchez is absolute robbery. We have we have a pending post that we may or may not release that really dives into the inner workings of how the uh, Sanchez family has just been feeding itself. Yeah, yeah. You can go there. you can go Google them. Like, there's a lawsuit from. 2014 from shareholders oh, yeah. that they were just enriching themselves at the expense like, of the get, company. So, like, get this: Sanchez Energy or whatever their their actual public entity is literally just a shell company with no employees. Okay, and then Sanchez Management or whatever is the one that actually runs the actual operations. And then they're selling selling acreage to companies that they both control. Not a conflict of interest at all. Yeah, uh, just be careful. So obviously, selfishly, I, I'd love to see something like that. The video you guys did on Oxy was on point, man. That was that was fantastic, and that was thinking about it. You, you know, you guys threw it out there. Who do you want to see next? And you know, there was probably six or eight six or eight companies. If I after thinking about it, Oxy would have been my number one. That was fantastic. And hey, so doing, Alex, doing something like Alex, that on stage is. I was gonna say, Alex said in the comments on a serious note, I agree with Joel that that's likely the best thing to do on your strategy of just providing value to the market. So, you know, Roy, what do you, you know, what do you think, man? Are you, are you on the side where Joel's at, like contracting and providing value, or are you still like, I know Roy, Roy's busting down fucking doors and putting out content. Like, I can see Roy being on the complete opposite side. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of a little different, though. I mean, we're, we're positioned a little different, right? We're a little bit different into the well, uh, maybe. I mean, I don't know. Uh, but, I mean, ultimately, like all of, all of our crew, and some of them were on earlier, too, but all of our crew, you know, we either had bits in the hole already, projects coming up, uh, stuff we were pushing to get in the hole, or wells that were going to be drilled that we had, you know, we had been given as a verbal commitment, hey, when we get back over to these wells, we'll put you guys back in the hole, you know, stuff like that. So like we didn't really have the luxury of being able to press pause or or not necessarily press pause, but we didn't have, you know, you got to keep your spurs to it right now on this side of the game. And so uh, coming over to drill formants, you know, one of the things that that we had to really focus on is a lot of people hadn't heard of drill formants uh, ever or in a while or thought they went by the wayside. But back in the Eagleford boom, drill formants was really a force to be reckoned with. I mean, NOV built an entire series of bits to compete against them. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, we have over here, it's right now, everybody on the drilling side specifically 
is requoting everything. They're looking at only running the bits that have you know high ROPs that stay in the hole that they can trust and know. Uh, and then on the directional side, I mean, you want to talk about a cutthroat business? I've never seen anything worse than the directional side of things. And um, I mean, you got directional companies that were making anywhere from seventy-five to nine grand a day uh, that are now able to charge five grand a day that they're slinging these kits for. And I mean, they're just trying to stay alive. Right. And then, yeah. you know, you got these other smaller guys, they can't compete with that. Right. So, I mean, our strategy here through this has been make sure and solidify your current relationships. Um, you know, like I was, you know, I text my guys regularly. I've kind of alternated, uh, you know, when I touch, do my customer touches for the week, you know, I try and say, um, you know, alternate like, Hey, how you doing? You know, how many beers you drink in, you know, you just kind of shoot the bull. Right. And then yeah. if they bring up work, I'll address it. Um, but like that call is not for work, right. That calls, Hey, hey homie, how you doing? And then the next yeah. one is we need to talk. Um, and so, you know, but ultimately as a company, I'm fortunate enough to have a pretty diversified portfolio. We have a huge line of completions tools. We have full package directional, we have bits, we have motors. So, I can go talk to this guy and if he doesn't want to talk about bits, well, okay, fine. But you need a mud motor. I got a mud motor. Um, or I can talk to this guy that says, I just want to pull the trigger once and write one check. Can you handle top to bottom for me? And, you know, yeah. so we have that leverage. And so we've really started when I went through this last time in 14, I was at NOV. And so um, as a salesperson in the division that I was in, I was responsible for almost 200 product lines. And yeah. so, Really, it was a nightmare, but walking down the hall uh, and somebody says, you know, the name of the game instantly becomes incremental revenue. So either new business or incremental revenue. So where can I go steal market share or get new business? And secondly, where's my incremental revenue coming from? So, yeah, you want me to take a 25 percent cut on what I'm selling you right now. But uh, we might can talk about that. The answer is no right now, but we can talk about that if you start running my liner hangers or you start running mm -hmm. you know, whatever else, right? Instead of giving that to Weatherford, give it to me. And, yeah. you know, yeah, now we can work together. together. Yeah. And so, um, and look, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to sound that ruthless, but I mean, like my good customers, man, the guys, you know, the guys that are going to continue to dance with the ones that brought them all day long, we're going to take care of each other. Right. But like, um, you know, if I got a customer that's willing to give me a shot and they're running somebody else, we're going to get dirty with it. Um, yeah. and we're going to do what it takes. So what I want to talk to what, what Roy just said, what he's, what he's saying and what he's more importantly, what he's doing is called resilience and the type of sale that he's doing. You have to have resilience. You have to have that drive. You have to have that push, uh, and, and that, that willing, willingness to win. <clears throat> I, I asked, there was a, uh, I went to a, uh, women's and leadership conference uh, at Rice. My boss was one of the guest speakers there. And so I was there. Wait, Stuck out yeah. like a sore thumb. <laughs> talk, about, uh, talk about diversity <laughs> and knowing what it's like to be on the other end. But it was really eye-opening, right? And the, the oh, keynote speaker. No, I, yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't wear the wig. That didn't, not, <laughs> not that time anyway. But the keynote speaker was a, a, a woman named Ann Fox. She's a former U.S. Marine combat veteran and CEO of Nine Energy Services absolutely fantastic absolutely fantastic and i asked her a question one of the first questions was uh from from me was what's what's the most important thing that the oil field has taught you sorry that the marine corps taught you that you've applied to the oil field and her answer resilience and so what roy's doing right now the type of sale the type of product the type of customers is he's showing that resilience and he's staying on he's also being very genuine and very honest with his, with his folks so that when rubber meets the road he gets the call he at least he gets the first the first shot when something goes wrong and uh, you know, he's a resource. So well, I applaud you. That's fantastic. Dude. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, hey guys, I got to cut out here in a minute, but I wanted to highlight this comment real quick before we get off from Alex. Um, Alex said, I don't even know if it's so much providing value to the market, but being a human uh, being who provides value from one human being to another human decency is often lacking in industries. And I think both of you guys have highlighted that, that, you know, this is about, uh, you know, treating people with respect, being authentic, genuine, um, having genuine relationships and, uh, you know, just just being there um, and helping however you can. So I think that's the winning uh, formula when it comes to sales and being able to you know, be resilient through a downturn like this. So 
Great comment, Alex. Um, everyone in the comments, appreciate you guys tuning in and contributing to the conversation. Um, it's coming one of my favorite pieces of content to do, man. Like I get to talk to cool people on here, cool people in the comments. Like we have different people in the comments every week. Um, I really like this format. So, you know, maybe sometime soon we'll have the battle of the directional drillers on here. You know, just me talking shit to them and them talking shit to me, just, you know, the piece of shit roughneck and, uh, we can get Greg and, and Todd on here too. So Roy, Joel, appreciate you guys coming on. Yeah. Hey, big cool. thanks guys. Yeah. Thanks for having us, gents. Appreciate it. Yep. I'll talk to y'all later. Later, man. See you guys.